In the working class suburbs of Nashua, New Hampshire, a seemingly idyllic teenage romance turned tragic, leaving a family shattered and a community in disbelief. It all began in May of 2002, when through an online message service, after their instant connection, the teens became inseparable. They exchanged messages daily and racked up over $500 in phone bills. Soon the two were talking about a future together, but before their future could begin, someone was going to die. This is a story of an obsessive teenage love affair to the extreme. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I am here with my co-host, my best friend, my partner in crime, Jonathan. Hi. And for those of you who've been asking what dark livity means, it's a word created specifically for this podcast. Dark livity is the dark downward slope into the degradation of the human mind and the consequences that such darkness brings to light. And that's exactly what we're going to be discussing in today's case. We post every Monday, but don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on what's next. Because last week we posted on Sunday, so you just never know. We may decide to post on a different day, but we try our best for Mondays. So keep that notification bell ringing. To grasp the entire context of the story, we have to take you back in time to meet a woman named Jean Domenico. She was born on August 29th in 1959 in Mountain, Massachusetts. She grew up in Braintree and completed her high school education at Braintree High School. After graduating, Jean pursued higher education at Curry College in Milton, Massachusetts. Upon completing her college studies in 1987, Jean relocated to Nashua, New Hampshire, eventually settling down and marrying a man named Anthony Kasinkas. And the couple went on to have two children together. First, a daughter, Nicole, and then a couple years later, a son named Charlie. The family lived at 6 Dumain Avenue in Nashua, New Hampshire, a quaint 1,100-square-foot New England Cape Cod-style home. It had three bedrooms, two small bedrooms downstairs with a tiny kitchen and a sitting area, and one bedroom upstairs, but only one small bathroom the whole family had to share. However, it did have a really nice big backyard and a garage. One day, Jean and her children, who were school-aged at the time, were at a nearby park when a new mother on maternity leave noticed Jean's kind nature and gentle tone with her own children. They began talking, and the mother, who was a teacher, asked Jean if she would be interested in looking after her new baby as a caretaker when she went back to work. Since the woman was a teacher, Jean would have weekends, summers, and all school holidays off to be with her own children. This was something that really appealed to Jean because she was focused on taking care of her family. The new mother had an instinct about Jean, and she would turn out to be correct. For years, Jean cared for this woman's daughter and even helped a little girl when she was later diagnosed with developmental delays. In fact, Jean was instrumental in the child receiving an early diagnosis. When it came time for the little girl to go to school, Jean and her friend worried that she would fall through the cracks. That's when Jean decided to take classes and become a certified paraprofessional educational aide. That way, the state would pay her to accompany the friend's child while they were at school. She did this until the little girl entered the third grade, and with Jean's care, she no longer needed an aide. As the years passed, Jean's marriage became tumultuous. It was plagued by poverty and domestic disputes that became physical, but through it all, Jean remained upbeat and positive. She finally decided to divorce Anthony in 1999, but she felt she had two blessings amidst her pain, her two children, Nicole and Charlie. As a single mom, Jean took the role with utmost dedication. Her children became her world, and she worked tirelessly to ensure she provided them the best life possible. Jean was known by her family, friends, co-workers, and acquaintances as the most kind and genuine person they had ever met. She made a conscious effort to see the best in everyone, and despite experiencing some often dire situations, she got through them all with her signature positivity and resilience. Even when she didn't have much herself, she was generous in all circumstances, even if it meant just sending over a homemade pina colada to a neighbor who had an exhausting day. Jean still raised her daughter Nicole and her son Charlie during this period. This meant she needed to seek full-time opportunity to accommodate her other two part-time jobs. It was essential for Jean to make sure her children knew they were her first priority. 
She would wake them up in the morning, get them ready for school, and take them to all their activities. More than anything, Jean wanted her kids to feel loved by her each and every day. Jean was fortunate to get a job at Oxford Health Plans in Hoekson, New Hampshire, as a senior service associate. This was only a 20-minute drive away. However, the demands of providing for her children meant that Jean had to spend long hours away from home. Her children became what's known as latchkey kids. This is a child whose parents are still at work when they get out of class. They usually walk home or take the bus, and then they let themselves inside the house until their parents come home. Nicole was around 14 and Charlie was 12. Jean trusted them to make the right decisions and behave at home alone as she raised them to be responsible and trustworthy. In the year 2000, while working at Oxford, she met a man by the name of Chris McGowan. They were both 40 years old at the time, with Jean being only one month older than Chris. The first thing Chris noticed about Jean was that she was a hard worker and she had pretty sparkling eyes. Chris was immediately drawn to Jean. He respected her dedication to her children, as well as her determination and commitment to work. And before long, the two were dating and eventually they became engaged. In the book entitled Because You Love Me by author William Phelps, Chris is quoted saying that, quote, there is no other woman he had ever met that could exude such charm and eloquence with just a simple facial expression and a smile, end quote. There was just something about Jean that was contagious and infectious. Chris said he was delighted to be in Jean's presence and that she made him feel comfortable and weak simultaneously. But by this time, Jean felt she needed to finish raising her children before she and Chris could get married. Chris, of course, respected Jean's decision, and he did his best to help her raise her kids and become a mentor and role model for them. As Kimber explained, Jean and the kids lived in a small house with only one bathroom. By the time she and Chris were dating, Jean had converted the attic space in the house into a bedroom for her daughter. It was chaotic with so many people trying to get ready every morning, but Chris still wanted to be close with Jean so he would often sleep over. But because he did not want to inconvenience anyone, he would get up earlier than everyone else in the morning, kiss Jean goodbye, and tell her he would see her later at work. He didn't want to interrupt the flow of the household and take up precious time fighting over their one and only bathroom in this tiny house. Chris lived only a few miles away in a large three-bedroom ranch-style house, but Jean wasn't ready to combine households until her children were grown up and on their own. Just like Jean, Chris was born in Massachusetts and raised in New Jersey before moving to Nashua, New Hampshire. Both he and Jean worked at Oxford on group contracts for the benefits brokers, and the administration department. That would be hard to have a house full of teenagers getting ready for work. I have a 12 year old right now and she's like 12 going on 16. And you've got, you know, the little teenage attitude and everything that goes with it. But speaking of teens, over the years, Jean and her teenage daughter, Nicole, were very close and friends would wish they had the same kind of relationship with their daughters. During the teenage years, things can become rocky. But as far as Jean was concerned, she and Nicole were still very close despite some recent ups and downs. We'll discuss that a little later in this episode. But of course, while Jean was at work, the kids have the run of the house and she worried about them, especially her son, Charlie. He had recently started hanging out with a rougher crowd and was prone to get angry. His explosive temper worried Jean because she knew that before her divorce, her children had witnessed devastating domestic disturbances at the hands of her ex-husband, Anthony. She feared that Charlie would follow his father down a path of the same physical violence, but she was hoping it was just a phase. But now let's jump to the summer of 2003. Chris had been with Jean for about three years now. Nicole was 16 and Charlie was 14. It was a normal morning on Wednesday, August 6th. No different than other mornings. Chris woke up at 6 a.m. He gave Jean a kiss on the cheek and told her he would see her at work later in the day. Since it was summertime, Jean was planning to leave work a little bit early and pick up dinner for their long-standing pizza and board game night. That Wednesday evening, Jean had plans to stop by a local restaurant that had a special where on certain nights, if you could pick it up before 5 p.m., you would get it for only $5. And Chris described Jean as somewhat of a penny pincher. And $5 pizza night became one of their traditions. I would love a $5 pizza night. That's a really good price for a pizza, but I mean, are we talking like 
A little personal pizza. We should start a board game night. That we would be fun. We kind of do have a board game night. We played the Roach game last night. That was a good game. That's a fun game. Bugs in the kitchen. On the other hand, Chris had plans to go straight home to his place after work. He intended to shower quickly and then drive to Jean's house for dinner and games with the kids. Chris planned to be over at 7.30 that night, giving Jean time to get home and go through a routine of cleaning up after the kids for the day and getting things ready. It actually bothered Chris that the kids weren't more helpful and didn't clean up after themselves. But he would hold his tongue because he knew these acts service were important to Jean. Before leaving that morning, Chris told Jean he loved her like he always did. It meant a lot to him to say I love you before leaving because he unexpectedly lost his father when he was only 10 years old. He never hesitated to tell those who were important to him that he loved them. Jean was his soulmate and he felt fortunate to have found her even though it was later in his life. According to Chris, Jean was an angel on earth. After work and washing up at his house, Chris called Jean at 7 p.m. before heading over to her house. Chris called her to see if he could pick up anything before he arrived, but he didn't get an answer when he called. He assumed she was outside walking the dogs. As Chris got into his car, he noticed he had a missed call on his phone from Jean's daughter, Nicole. Nicole had left him this long, rambling voice message expressing her frustration about not being able to get in contact with her mother. She told Chris she could not reach anyone at their house, and Charlie was at a friend's house, and Nicole mentioned that her mom came home later than they had planned, and Nicole wanted to know if she was with Chris. Nicole also told Chris that it was her boyfriend Billy's last night visiting before he had to head back to where he lived in Connecticut. They were in a long-distance relationship at the time, and they had been dating since May of 2002, so about a little over a year at this point. They went to a bowling alley to play some pool so she could spend time with him before he took the two-hour drive back home the next day. So she let Chris know they would be late for pizza and game night. Nicole asked Chris to call Billy's cell phone when her mom came home. Chris had actually told Nicole not to leave him these really long voice messages, so he saved it to show her later so he could address it. But she was always good about letting them know where she was going and where she was and who she was with. After this, Chris headed over to Jean's, but on the way over, he stopped at a 7-Eleven directly behind her house to pick up her favorite soda, and I thought to myself, that is something that you would do. You always pick up my favorite soda. What's my favorite soda? Oh, today it's been Cherry Pepsi. But what is it usually? That's- Dr. Pepper. Yes, exactly. It sounds like he was a really sweet guy and that they were really in love. Well, from the parking lot of this 7-Eleven, Chris could see that Jean's car was parked in her driveway. So he didn't understand why she wasn't picking up her phone. This was a house phone that he'd been calling, by the way, just to clarify, it's a landline inside the house. As Chris walked up the driveway, he noticed another anomaly. Buster, Jean's shisu, was anxiously yapping on the back porch of the house in the backyard tied to a stake on a long leash. Now, this is something that Jean would do when she first got home. She would put the dog out to go to the bathroom and then bring him back in. But again, this didn't make much sense. By Chris's estimate, Jean would have been home for two and a half hours by this point. So he wondered, why would Buster still be outside like that? Buster's behavior was also unusual. He was usually calm and well-behaved. Chris noticed Buster had also left a mess on the welcome mat, which he rarely did. Buster was usually an inside dog, but would use a dog crate. Jean couldn't rely on the kids to take the dog in or out, so putting him on a long leash tied to the stake was an automatic ritual of Jean's until she got settled when she arrived home. As Chris opened the front door, he noticed the long summer days were getting darker, and the interior lights hadn't been turned on. The other thing Chris noticed was the silence in the house, and the fact that the door was slightly ajar. As Chris's mind registers these odd anomalies, he's still puzzled by Buster's behavior and the inability to locate Jean. Chris speculates that she might have gone for a long walk, but it wasn't often that she would take a random walk around the neighborhood. She usually had her dogs with her, Buster and a husky named Princess, who was also outside in the backyard, so it was very unlikely Jean was on a walk alone. As Chris stepped inside the house, he called out for Jean, saying, Hello, Jean, honey, are you in here? But there was no response. It was dark inside, but as he made his way to the kitchen... There was a tiny bit of light coming out from a crack in the refrigerator door, which was slightly opened, and that was odd. So Chris again called out Jean's name as he walked further into the house. And as his eyes adjusted, there was something Chris saw that his brain couldn't reconcile. A pair of legs on the floor. It was Jean. She was lying face down. Chris immediately assumed that she had fallen and hit her head. He began calling out to her, imploring her to wake up and respond to him. But again, he got no response. Chris began shaking Jean, 
believing that she had passed out after hitting her head on something like the stove. Jean had recently started the Atkins diet and she was having some dizzy spells. So for the past few weeks, she'd been complaining about not feeling like herself and she'd even called her doctor to report dizziness. She explained it was a feeling like she was tipsy and she had dropped several pounds in a very short amount of time. But other than the dizziness, Jean was happy about the weight loss. But could this have been related? A side effect of some kind. As Chris stood there trying to put things together while he stared at Jean's unresponsive body, he noticed a pool of blood underneath her head and upper torso. It was still wet, causing Chris to assume that this was a recent accident. The moment he noticed the blood, he reached for the phone and dialed 911. When the operator answered, Chris began to sound hysterical like he'd been talking to Jean, asking what happened. He told the operator that he believed Jean fell and hit her head. Chris sounded shaky and started mumbling and muttering things to himself. He sounded panicked and confused. When the operator asked Chris to check Jean's pulse, he couldn't feel anything because his hands were shaking so badly. While on the phone with the operator, Chris looked around and thought an intruder might be inside the house. Instead of an accident, he thought it was possible that something violent had happened to his fiance. What Chris didn't mention was the blood spatter all over the kitchen. It would be almost impossible not to notice the blood on the cabinet doors, the refrigerator, the table, the chairs, and even the kitchen ceiling. The blood even reached the carpet in the living room. There were also large blood droplets leading up to the stairs. All this seemingly went unnoticed, but definitely unmentioned by Chris. The home was in disarray. Furniture was knocked over, the coffee table was shattered, and it was quite a chaotic scene. There amongst the horror was something simple, familiar, and grounding. A note left by Jean's daughter Nicole on the kitchen counter was written earlier that evening when the kitchen was a place of joy and laughter. It explained that she was going to Lita Lane's bowling alley to play pool with Billy. It also mentioned that the couple would most likely stop at Brewster's, which was an ice cream shop nearby. Billy signed the note at the end and it read, Love Billy and Nicole and thank Jean and said if she needed to reach them to call his cell phone. Then he said, P.S. Have Chris come over for a Pictionary rematch. What a juxtaposition as this note existed among such a gory scene, one that Chris still hadn't completely been able to take in. He was still on the phone with the 911 operator and he just kept repeating over and over again that he didn't know what happened to Jean or what she had hit her head on. At this point, the TV in the living room was making it almost impossible for Chris to concentrate. The operator was asking him to kneel down and put his ear to Jean's mouth to see if he could figure out if she was still breathing. He asked her, can I please turn off the TV because it was distracting him. But the operator told him not to touch anything until she was able to get an officer over there. At this point, she put Chris on hold as she dialed a unit in the area for assistance as well as an ambulance. The operator told Chris to stay on the line, but he didn't. Instead, he went to Jean's body, picked up her head and cradled it in his hands. He noticed how cold she felt. He whispered that he loved her one last time, saying, I love you, honey. He had no idea at that time that her body was covered in stab wounds. As he heard sirens, he just held Jean, then gave her a kiss on the cheek. As he moved her hair away from her face, she had a cold, glassy stare, and he realized that she was gone forever. He wondered how her children would take this news. And I can't even imagine. I'm getting upset and sad just thinking about finding somebody that I love, my soulmate, just dead and gone forever. And thinking about what her children are going to feel like when they find out that their mother is dead, it's a lot to take in. Well, the first responder to the scene was veteran Nashua police officer, Kurt Gautier. He was dispatched to what was relayed over the radio as a sudden death. He got there in just three minutes. Chris was still trying to figure out if Jean was still alive, but when officer Gautier took one look at her, there was no doubt about it. Jean was deceased. He recalled it being, in his words, a bloody mess, and he remembers seeing blood everywhere, all over the floor, all over the cabinetry. In his opinion, it was a massive amount, and it was still wet. He immediately knew that this was a murder, and considering it was a violent crime, the officer couldn't help but wonder if the only other person there was the culprit, Chris McGowan. I mean, I don't blame him for assuming that Chris could have been responsible for this without even knowing much about their dynamic, 
I mean, he's the partner. That's always the first person that's going to be scrutinized. And within just a few minutes, other units from the Nashville Police Department had arrived, including another officer, Jeff Connors, who escorted Chris out of the house so they could allow medical personnel inside. Outside, they roped off a perimeter around Jean's home, and Sergeant William Moore took charge of the perimeter duty. He assigned Detective Sean Hill to a position on the west side of the house. Chris was outside with some of the other officers, while Connors and Gautier were inside, clearing the rest of the premises, making sure that an intruder wasn't still inside. The medics confirmed what they already knew. Jean was dead. And when Chris was given the confirmation, he yelled out loud, Oh my God! Oh my God! And he was pacing back and forth with his hands on his head. And then he dropped to the ground on his knees. And at this point, One of Jean's neighbors and friends that we're going to call Karen Smith, a 29-year-old mother of three children who Nicole would often babysit for, walked up to see what was going on and noticed all the cop cars, the yellow crime scene tape. And she said, what the hell is going on? And that's when she saw Chris. She called out to him, but he remained silent, just sitting there. So she repeated, what is going on here? Chris just turned to Karen and said, she's dead. There's blood everywhere. Well, Karen had no idea what Chris could be talking about. Who was dead? Chris just sat there on his knees crying and crying. Then he just shouted, why? Why would someone do this to Jean? Why did this happen? And now Karen knew who was hurt. And she couldn't even begin to comprehend the magnitude of what happened. She realized she'd rushed over, leaving her own kids back at the house alone. So she had to leave. Plus, at this point, Chris had to give a statement to the police, but the officers did tell Karen that she would also be interviewed at some point, considering she was right next door. They would want to know if she had heard or seen anything unusual that day. All Karen could think about when she got back inside her own house and saw her kids was how Jean's son and daughter were going to hold up finding out their mother was dead. One by one, Jean's neighbors discovered that everything was not well on Dumaine Avenue. Around 7.30 p.m., 25-year-old Carla Hall, who lived right across the street from Jean, drove up to Dumaine from Amherst Street. That's when she saw the police activity, the cop cars, the crime scene tape, and the ambulance. Most people have never actually witnessed a crime, especially a murder, so close to home. We all see it on TV or watch true crime videos like this one, but it rarely becomes a reality. From where she was at the end of the street, Carla could tell that something had happened at either Karen or Jean's place. Those were the first few homes on the block, and the cops weren't letting anyone through. Every car was turning around. Carla pulled over and walked up to one of the officers to ask what was going on, but instead of getting answers, she was informed in no uncertain terms that no one, including residents living on Dumaine Avenue, were allowed to enter this area. Even when Carla pointed to her house and told them she lived just a couple of homes away, the officer told her it didn't matter. Carla got back inside her car and quickly called Karen to see what had happened. As soon as Karen answered the phone, it was obvious she was shook up and had been crying. Karen informed Carla of the news that Jean was dead, and it appeared that she had been murdered. That's all she knew, but it was enough to send Carla into a state of shock. Jean's dead? After getting this news, Carla marched back to the officer she had previously spoken to and let him know she heard the news that her friend Jean had been murdered. She asked again if she could please be escorted to her home. Carla was so close with Jean, even though she'd only live across the street for about a year, she actually believed that Jean had changed her life for the better in that short amount of time and now she was dead. It was a lot for her to take in. The officer could tell she was upset and agreed to let her go home. Carla couldn't believe that Jean, of all people, would have been killed. She immediately thought about the fact that Jean was a mother. How devastating. What a tremendous loss, especially losing someone like Jean, who Carla knew as such a positive and loving woman. Carla even referred to Jean's smile as contagious, and her voice was comforting and friendly, and now she was gone. Carla's thoughts went right to Jean's kids, and she wondered if they were home, wondered if they knew. And as she walked into her driveway, she shouted to one of the officers in the roadway, telling him they had to find Nicole and Charlie and make sure that they were okay. But most importantly, to make sure they were informed about their mother's death before they found out some other way. As Carla entered her own home, all the memories that she shared with Jean flashed through her mind. Things as little as Jean coming over with a pina coladas or how much she cared about others, even when she was going through her own struggles. 
Now, crime scene investigators were standing above her lifeless body, processing the scene. As they looked around, they immediately noticed several crucial pieces of evidence. Inside Jean's kitchen sink was a broken steak knife. Pieces were found inside, and then two additional knives were found outside in the backyard of the house. They also discovered a bloody palm print on the refrigerator door, and footprints were observed leading from the kitchen to the home's second story. Detectives were struck by the level of violence inflicted upon Jean. The presence of multiple knives, a bloody palm print, and the footprint suggested that the killer was determined and capable of extreme brutality, even at the expense of leaving evidence behind. This indicated a strong motive or a personal connection between the perpetrator and the victim. Well, by this point, they already had a prime suspect. Can you guess who? Well, obviously at this point, Chris was the only person they'd spoken to. He found her. He had access to the house. He called 911 and he was her partner. So I'm guessing it's him. Exactly. Chris was the first person the detectives wanted to speak with. He was covered in blood and standing right outside Jean's home. He was still shaken up, so answering even the simplest questions was difficult for Chris. Before they could really get any information out of him, he told the detective he needed to use the restroom. Chris suffered from multiple sclerosis, and his need was imminent. They denied him of the ability to use Jean's bathroom, so he asked to use the neighbors, but the officer still denied his request. First, they didn't want to let Chris out of their sight, and second, they were concerned that Chris would try to dispose of any evidence he was hiding. But after Chris explained he really had to go, they walked him to the edge of the woods behind Jean's home, and an officer watched him closely as he relieved himself. It was in that moment that Chris realized he was, in fact, a suspect. And he definitely was, so much so that a neighbor from the street asked an officer if they should be concerned about their family's safety, and the answer was no, that they already had a suspect identified. And I don't know. I mean, I get it, but it is, in my opinion, a little too fast to assume that the public was not in danger at this point. Right, especially for how Chris was acting, too. I mean, it seems like he didn't do it, you know? I mean, we can't see his reactions, but I mean, I would would think so from what I've been reading. Well, Chris had a theory of his own. When detectives did get around to speaking with him, they knew he wasn't in the best state of mind. So they were going to keep things brief. Still, they did ask him if he knew anyone that would want to harm Jean, and he was pretty quick to point the finger at her ex-husband, Anthony Kaczynskis. They'd had a violent past, and Chris said he immediately thought of Anthony when he realized Jean had been attacked. That night, the detectives spoke to several of Jean's neighbors to further corroborate Chris's statement. These neighbors reiterated that Jean and Anthony had a volatile relationship and that Jean had expressed fear of him in the past. So they shifted their focus on Anthony as another potential suspect in the crime. They got his contact information and they were about to reach out to find his whereabouts when something happened at the crime scene. Jean's 14-year-old son Charlie had come home. Upon seeing the commotion at his house, he appeared anxious and confused. He wanted to know where his mother was and what happened. He quickly pulled a neighbor aside and wanted to know what was happening. But before she could tell him anything, the police transferred him to the police station and called his father. Charlie, being a minor, needed permission to talk to them. This was complicated because Charlie's father is Anthony Kazinkas, who was also a preliminary suspect in Jean's murder. Even neighbors mentioned Charlie as not having the best relationship with his mother. According to those who lived close by, and were familiar with the family, Charlie held a lot of anger against his mother after the divorce, and he and Jean argued quite frequently. He stayed out most nights with friends and wouldn't come home. The relationship between them had continued to deteriorate, with Charlie becoming increasingly withdrawn and unwilling to communicate with Jean. Even Chris had mentioned that Charlie's behavior had been out of control lately, implying that there had been some concerning incidents in the recent past. Chris was being questioned when Charlie arrived at the station, and Chris had already told the detectives that Jean didn't like to keep knives in their house because she feared that her son might pick one up and use it in the heat of the moment when they were arguing. Wow, that's pretty intense. So when Charlie's brought into the station, detectives aren't sure where to start and how to treat both Charlie and his father. Would they be categorized as grieving loved ones or something more sinister? They were focusing on Chris at this time. He was now giving a more formal statement, and he said he was shocked to learn that Jean's death was officially labeled a homicide because some part of him was still hoping that this was some kind of freak accident. But detectives let him in on the fact that Jean had been stabbed. That's what prompted him to bring up Charlie and the knives. It was even more tragic that she had been stabbed because as long as Chris had known Jean, 
He said that she was terrified of knives. In fact, she refused to have knives in her home at all until the time that she began dating Chris. Initially, she told Chris that she had had a premonition that she might die by being stabbed. It was later that she finally shared she was really worried that her son, Charlie, in a rage, would do something to her with the knives and then regret it. But all that changed when she began dating Chris and he tried to cut a steak with a butter knife. That's when he decided he was going to buy Jean a set of knives. And at first, Jean would lock the knives in her bedroom at night for a long time. But eventually, she became more comfortable with the idea of having them out on the counter. Chris usually spent the night, and that helped to lessen her fears about the knives. What Chris didn't realize was that he just told the police he purchased the murder weapons that killed Jean. I mean, the fact that this woman was so deathly afraid of knives, even being in her home, says something right there. And then Chris is the one bringing the thing she fears right into her house. Remember, they found a steak knife in her sink. That's terrifying. And Chris felt bad saying it, but when asked if he thought that Charlie could have been responsible for this, he pretty much made it clear that he thought he was capable. He told the investigators Jean was very worried about him. She was worried about both of her children. He said Jean hadn't even set a wedding date with him because she wanted to help her children achieve their goals first. She wanted them to reach their full potential and believe they deserved her undivided attention outside of work. According to the book, Because You Love Me, he stated that he waited all of his life for Jean and could wait another four or five years if he needed to. Now the focus turned on Jean's daughter, Nicole, and the investigators asked Chris what she was like and whether she got along with her mother. Chris described Nicole as an honor student, was responsible, and usually got along with Jean. However, as she got into her teenage years, things started to shift a bit, with Nicole wanting to be looked at as more an adult, and Jean still wanting to treat her as a child. Nicole was going through the rough phase some young women go through where they don't feel great about themselves. Nicole thought she was fat, and she suffered from intermittent depression and low self-esteem. She was bullied at school, and in the last couple of years, she became increasingly unhappy in her own skin. And that's too bad. So many teenagers go through this. I know I did. All the hormonal changes and feeling like you don't know how to express what you're feeling inside. It's a very trying time for both teenagers and especially their parents. And I think it could be worse for young women compared to, to young men. I think everyone goes through it, but you hear more cases of women. Yeah. So Nicole and Jean had been close, but lately they were butting heads. And one of the things they couldn't agree on was whether 16-year-old Nicole was old enough to have a serious relationship. And that's another very common issue that I can definitely relate to. So many of us think that we're so grown up at 16 and even at 18, but really the brain has not reached adulthood yet. I think it's what, 25? Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Plus, even though Nicole got good grades, it was tough for her. She was being bullied at school, and she didn't feel like she had a solid support system in place. Sometimes a parent isn't enough, and teens don't truly feel loved. Nicole described herself as slightly overweight, and she thought she was ugly and unlovable. Still, Chris explained that fortunately, all that changed when she met her 18-year-old boyfriend, Billy. You're probably already thinking it. How did Jean feel about this? Well, as we mentioned, the couple had been dating for 15 months and Billy just spent last week over at Jean's home. Recall the note investigators found on the kitchen counter. Billy thanked Jean for letting him stay over and hoped to have another game night with Chris. But this week-long visit wasn't planned and Jean wasn't thrilled about it. Actually, we think it's important to tell you how Billy ended up in Nicole's life and how the family dynamic finally changed once Nicole gained more confidence after meeting Billy. Chris shared the background on how Nicole and Billy began dating. He told detectives that over a year ago in May 2002, then 14-year-old Nicole met 17-year-old William Sullivan, who went by Billy. They met through an online instant message service. At this time, Billy lived with his mother and sisters in Connecticut. The two teens began chatting online regularly, and Nicole got to know Billy's whole life story or what he was willing to share with her. I remember those days of chat rooms and connecting with people behind a screen. And it can be a lot of fun, but just like online dating today, you don't really know who you're talking to. But Billy really was who he said he was. He was a teenager looking for a connection. 
Billy was born William Joseph Sullivan Jr. in 1985. He weighed just five pounds at birth and was born prematurely because his mother, Patricia, who went by Pat, admittedly drank and smoked throughout her entire pregnancy with him. And unfortunately, Billy came from a family that faced a lot of challenges with alcohol and drugs, but that wasn't all. At the time of his birth, Pat was living in a house with her older son that she had from a previous relationship and Billy's father, who was also named Billy. When Billy's father got drunk, he was often violent and would even strike and attack Patricia, with Billy still in her arms. That's really sad because that child has to witness that. And even when they're a baby, it's they are taking all that in. Well, as a toddler, he experienced a lot of violence. There was one incident where Billy's father punched Pat in the face, opening up a gash above her eye. As a result, blood was spewing all over the place, including all over the little baby Billy. It took 17 stitches to close the wound on Pat's face, and this was the beginning of the end of her relationship with Billy's father. By this time, little Billy was suffering from night terrors. He would wake up screaming and unable to breathe or calm himself down. By the age of two and a half, Billy had been to the emergency room five times with breathing-related incidents. They diagnosed this as asthma, but Pat believed it was just anxiety-induced response to Billy's trauma. Yeah, that does not sound like mere asthma to me, not considering everything that that little boy had witnessed. As a toddler, Billy became hyperactive and violent getting into inconsolable rages that ended with him destroying things and hitting his younger sisters. Plus, instead of a cozy home, Billy, his mother, and his four sisters had to move into a motel. It was a temporary shelter, and it was all that they could afford at the time. However, one fateful night changed Billy's life and left a lasting impression on him. The motel caught on fire, and Billy watched as it went up in flames. His family was luckily not inside, but it was a place where many of his friends lived. He was in a panic because he believed many of his friends were still inside the fire and couldn't get out. Billy watched in horror as everything they owned burned to the ground. He was only four years old when this happened. The sound of sirens echoed through the night, signaling the arrival of firefighters and emergency services. Little Billy didn't know that the sound of sirens would haunt him for years, triggering him to remember that horrific night. Wow. That is so traumatic. And this incident became deeply ingrained in Billy's mind. He was terrified. And in the days following the fire, Pat said that Billy was never the same again. Yeah, anytime he heard that piercing sound of a siren, his heart would race and a sense of dread would wash over him. No matter how many years went by, all it took was the sound of sirens and he was transported back to that moment, reliving the fear and helplessness he felt as a child. That event also caused Billy to become aware of death at a very young age. He thought about other people dying and sometimes talked about himself being dead. And that's really sad. And his mother, she actually referred to this as his death thoughts. These are concepts and worries that are really unusual for a four-year-old to have, but they persisted. Billy would often tell Pat about his desire to die. He would point to a lake or a river and tell his mother he wanted to go in the water to sleep or he wanted to die in the fire. Wow. And I wonder if this was somehow comparable to like survivor's guilt in some way, but I know that's probably not possible for such a young child to be able to understand, but I'm surprised that he could even conceptualize what death was. But then again, he had seen violence before. He knew people bled and felt pain. So I'm assuming he understood if someone was hurt enough, they would no longer be alive. And this is when Pat put her son into therapy. She was no longer with his father at the time, but noticed that once she did get divorced, Billy began acting out against people outside of their family. And according to Pat, he, quote, had out of control behavior and violence and throwing things and hitting things and people, end quote. However, over time, it seemed as though Billy was making some progress in therapy. His doctors were testing out different types of treatments, even medications, but things were still not easy. By the time Billy was seven years old, he had gone to kindergarten twice and told his therapist that the brother of one of his sister's friends had touched him inappropriately in a tent during a sleepover. This caused him even more deep-seated issues. After that, Billy's behavior became more self-destructive. He would jump off of roofs, out of trees, and he was doing dangerous things that could harm him. That must be so hard as a parent, because what do you do? You want to help your child and get them through all the pain, but at times, it's beyond a parent's ability, especially if they're also dealing with things like addiction themselves. To make things even worse, when Billy was only eight, 
One of his good friends died in a terrible accident. It was too much for Billy to take in, and it landed him in a children's psychiatric hospital. That is so young to be hospitalized in a facility like that. And I wonder if he grew up faster than most children his age because of how much he had to witness. Well, he stayed at the facility for 30 days. That's a long time. He resented his mother for sending him away and would cry to her over the phone. And when they'd hang up following these emotional phone calls, the staff would have to restrain him so he couldn't harm himself. When he finally went home, he did appear calmer. But Pat thought it was all because of the medications he was taking. Some of the medications included Respiradol, Depakote, Ritalin, Prozac, Lithium, Zoloft, and Thorazine. Basically, Billy was so drugged, he was a zombie. The doctors were working hard to find the right combination of drugs to allow Billy to live a somewhat normal life. Again, I can't help but think about how young he is while all this is going on and all those medications that he was on. I wonder what that alone can do to a person because it definitely does change the chemistry in your brain. You're taking a drug. That's what I was just about to say. Like his brain is still developing, right? Yeah. And like these medications are blocking off all of the synapses that are trying to grow. And I don't know. I'm not a neurologist. I don't know. I know. We're not doctors. I mean, if it's going to benefit someone, then doctors make that decision. And isn't like everyone's brain like a different sort of highway where synapses lead to other synapses that aren't like the same as yours or mine? So like one drug might affect me differently oh, how it affects you. Oh, absolutely. It affects everybody it's like, it's like almost impossible. Well, medications and being sent away to psychiatric hospitals became the norm for Billy. Pat felt those were her only options. She tried to have at-home care for Billy, but in 1994, when Billy was nine years old, he attacked one of the workers with a baseball bat. Then he used the bat to destroy some of his sister's belongings. According to Pat, she no longer qualified for that type of assistance after the incident. Billy was again sent back to Elmcrest Children's Hospital for another 30-day stay. After that, he was placed at another hospital where he became what Pat called, quote, part of the psychiatric hospital revolving door syndrome, end quote. Anything the doctors tried with Billy was usually just a temporary fix. By that time, Billy understood that if he wanted to go home, all he had to do was pretend to have changed. By the age of 11, his aggression towards his sisters continued, and he was admitted two more times to psychiatric hospitals. By now, Billy was having problems at school, threatening teachers and starting fights with other students. His life seemed out of control, and Pat feared nothing could help her son. She petitioned for the state of Connecticut to assign him to a probation officer. Billy was scheduled to meet with his probation officer twice a month to discuss his behavior and the consequences he would face if he didn't change his ways. It appeared this structure and accountability worked for a while. Billy calmed down at school, but his behavior at home was unchanged. Pat wanted to get off welfare and return to school to better herself, but she couldn't because she couldn't find a sitter who would stay with Billy. She couldn't trust him alone with his sisters. Wow, and that's really like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't know how truthful this story is because it's Pat's account of Billy's life, but regardless, I'm sure that it wasn't easy. And I wondered if a lack of a father figure had anything to do with Billy's behavior. And in 1998, when Billy was 13, he was sitting in class in middle school and just looking out the window when he saw a truck drive by. And Billy convinced himself that it was his dad looking for him after all these years. So he ran after the truck, but of course, he just up and left in the middle of class. So the school officials went after him. And that's when Billy became violent and again, wound up in a children's psychiatric hospital. And by now, Billy had been transferred to hospitals all over the state of Connecticut and was even twice arrested for fighting at the hospitals. His most prolonged inpatient care lasted a year. And at that time, he was located an hour away from his mother and sisters. And that meant they couldn't visit him very often. And I bet that made him feel utterly unwanted, alone, and abandoned. It's almost like it could have done more harm than good. According to the book, Because You Love Me, the hospital deemed Billy extremely unruly and detached from reality. In response, a nurse administered Haldol, also known as Haloperidol, and this drug is commonly prescribed to children experiencing hallucinations, manic episodes, aggression, agitation, and disorganized thinking caused by schizophrenia. Billy's violent outbursts persisted, causing concern among those around him. There were several instances where Billy displayed his aggressive nature. One particular incident stood out when he chased after his mother with a baseball bat. Still, when Billy started taking his new medication, his mental health started to stabilize. The positive change in his condition allowed him to focus on his personal growth, and he began thriving. 
Shortly after, he secured a job and resumed his education, finishing high school. Maybe he was truly experiencing more of a specific disorder this entire time, and he was on the wrong medications from being misdiagnosed. That's really not that uncommon for that to happen. And this new medication was supposed to be good for mania and even schizophrenia. So maybe all along, those were underlying issues. So just, it makes you think. I'm not a doctor, but... Billy did end up having one additional outburst in April of 2001. This was just 13 months before meeting Nicole online. Pat had to call police to her house because Billy was threatening to harm himself. He was dealing with some personal things at the time that got too tough for him. Pat threatened to call the police, but he told her he would have them shoot him because he wanted to die. The police took Billy to the hospital once again for a psychiatric evaluation. He told doctors that he was sorry that all this happened. It was because he'd stopped taking his meds. He promised to take them and be better if they released him. By that time, Billy was taking lithium and it appeared to be working and stabilizing his moods. He went back on his meds and things went back to normal. At least what normal looked like in Billy's world when he wasn't threatening self-harm or having outbursts. Fast forward to when Nicole and Billy met. They instantly related to one another, maybe because Nicole also had a violent father and felt somewhat alone, but they both came from divorced families and were looking for a connection, for someone to truly love them. After their instant online connection, the two became inseparable, or at least neither one of them wanted to do anything except chat with the other online. They moved their conversations to the phone and ended up racking up a $500 phone bill. This was back when people had to pay long distance, I'm assuming, because I think it would be hard to rack up charges these days. But wow, I, I do remember racking up a bill when I was like in middle school and high school. Friends would call boys in our class. They would hang up. They would do prank calls. But of course, their parents were not thrilled, especially Jean. You're racking up these bills. You're talking to this boy. Young and vibrant teenage Nicole found herself on the brink of a whirlwind romance. At first, Nicole, who felt completely unlovable due to her low self-esteem, had mentioned to Billy that she was worried he would think she was fat. But he told her he thought chubby girls were sexy, and that was a huge relief to her. So I was thinking, okay, she's concerned, and instead of saying, no, you're fine, was he saying that she was fat? I don't know. But anyway, he likes chubby girls. And then within a week of chatting with Nicole, Billy was already telling her that he thought he loved her. However, Jean and Chris held reservations about this budding relationship. They shared a common concern, Nicole's age. They believed she was too young to be entangled in the complexities of love or what felt like love. Jean being a caring and protective mother, she wanted Nicole to focus on her studies and her personal growth. Jean herself had experienced the ups and downs of love, and she understood the importance of waiting for the right time. But Jean, like many parents, also realized that this was typical of many teenagers her age. They tend to develop an infatuation with boys, and Jean figured it would just fizzle out as quickly as it began, especially since the two of them were long distance. But instead, it seemed as though Billy and Nicole's love was only growing stronger. Before long, Jean became concerned that their puppy love bordered on obsession. Their relationship had become very intense before they even met in person. I think we've all had at least one of these infatuations as a teen. But Nicole had even painted a mural on the ceiling of her bedroom professing her love for Billy and her intention to be with him forever. It was days of the young, obsessive love when the two just lived for the day that they could finally be together. It's like a fairy tale, kind of like Romeo and Juliet. But it's not that uncommon. I feel that everyone's been through that at least once, At right? least once with somebody. Yeah. You like think you're so in love. One reason Nicole fell for Billy was because of how much he complimented her. He told her she was a goddess and he was lucky to be her boyfriend. He didn't understand why she didn't have a dozen boys begging to be with her. Nicole had never been told anything like this before. The validation was intoxicating. Yeah, and it's also called love bombing. And sometimes it's not entirely genuine. But this reminds me of the show Love is Blind. I know you haven't really watched much of it. I just started watching it. But when two people haven't met they think they're feeling love because this feeling's building and building the anticipation of meeting this person. And they're in love with the idea of being in love. But I truly do agree with Jean's reservations that kids this young usually can't handle all of this and should instead be focusing on themselves. But you can't tell them that. 
they'll just rebel. Right. And I think a lot of people like the idea of being validated by another person. Right. Seemingly self-worth. Nicole had never been told anything like this before. And psychologists familiar with cases of teenage obsession emphasize the potent cocktail of emotions at play. Still navigating the tumultuous waters of identity formation and autonomy, adolescents often fixate on romantic partners to establish a sense of self-worth and validation. When faced with parental disapproval, this fix can morph into a dangerous obsession, blinding individuals to the consequences of their actions. Jean recognized the potential toxicity of their relationship almost immediately, and she wasn't afraid to let Nicole know that, as a caring parent would. She was concerned. Instead of being seen as tough love, Jean was seen as an obstacle to their love story. Jean was their villain. Nicole and Billy thought she was trying to tear them apart. However, Jean thought Billy wasn't right for her daughter. And Nicole was devastated when Jean refused to allow her and Billy to talk on the phone due to the high phone bills. Jean made Nicole get a job babysitting to pay back the high phone bills that averaged between $500 to $1,000. And remember the neighbor we told you about? She was 29-year-old Karen Smith, the woman who came over to see what the commotion was and realized that her three children were left unattended. Well, that was who Nicole had been babysitting for. She also saw Karen as somewhat of a friend that she could confide in, considering Karen was younger than her mother. Nicole felt like she understood her more. And of course, sometimes it's easier to talk to someone that isn't your parent. Remember how the police told Karen she would be interviewed? Well, she was. And she provided more insight into exactly what she thought Nicole was feeling and going through with Billy and Jean. But we'll get to that a little later. Nicole did begin paying her mother back for the phone bill, and Billy was trying hard to prove that he was right for Nicole. He even took the time to write a heartfelt letter to Jean. Billy expressed gratitude to Nicole's mother for bringing such an incredible and beautiful person into the world. He made it clear that he intended to spend the rest of his life with Nicole, how they both had plans to work hard and save money together so they could get their own place. However, this letter filled Jean with fear and anxiety instead of bringing her joy and acceptance. Jean was overwhelmed by Nicole thinking she was ready to commit herself to someone for the rest of her life. She couldn't help but worry about what this meant for Nicole's future and their relationship as a family. Jean felt as though Nicole was slipping away. They used to be so close, but Jean tried her best to be supportive. Eventually, Nicole convinced her mom to take her to Connecticut so she could meet Billy in person. Jean hoped this would end their relationship, but if anything, they became more obsessed with one another. Their first meeting was an eight-hour date where Jean met Billy's mom and chaperoned. Everything went well until Nicole had to leave. This showed Jean how immature her daughter was, and she was caught in puppy love. When Jean and Nicole pulled out of Billy's driveway, Nicole was hysterical for the entire 108 mile two hour drive home just crying and sobbing uncontrollably because billy didn't have a car or driver's license at the time they wouldn't be able to see each other more often leaving nicole feeling helpless billy actually came up with an idea he wanted nicole to move in with him and his mom and have nicole finish high school in connecticut that way he could be together with her but jean wouldn't even entertain that idea she made it clear that nicole would live with her until she turned 18. Later, when she found out Nicole and Billy wanted to get a joint checking account to save for their future, Jean ended that dream too. She told Nicole to never let a man have control over your money. I mean, she wasn't wrong. It's good to be independent, but that also means being independent of a man. And speaking as a woman who as an adult has made mistakes like that, Jean just seems like she loves her daughter and wants the best for her. Over the next 15 months, Nicole and Billy's relationship grew stronger. Billy worked as a fry cook manager at McDonald's and was helping to support his mother and sisters. He dreamed of becoming the manager of a McDonald's restaurant someday. He told Nicole his dreams were doable and would support their future family. He would tell Nicole they would do better than their parents. They would get a college education and buy a house before starting a family together. The two began making a list of everything they would need to do to live on their own someday, down to the kitchen appliances and bathroom linens. Those aren't bad goals to have, but I could see only being 16 and 18, and they had just met. Their parents would probably think they are rushing things. But I'm curious to read the comments from the audience because I know a lot of you are parents like I am and like John will be soon. And it's actually really frightening for me to think about our kids making their own decisions. I was a lot to handle when I was a teenager and 16 and 18 just seems way too young to be on their own. 
That's a good question though. Is 18, I mean, it is considered an adult, but what are your thoughts? I'm asking the audience. Well, Nicole thought she was old enough to decide. So she wrote her mom a letter telling her she was deeply unhappy and begging to live with Billy and his mother. Now, I am not a huge fan of reading things verbatim. (laughs) You probably know that by now, but I think it is important to understand everyone in this case, especially being able to hear Nicole's own words. So this letter read in part, quote, Mom, I'm going to put this as blatant as possible. I want to move in with Billy. I know you probably think how stupid and naive I am by saying that, but I'm really unhappy here. I guess I can hide it pretty well sometimes, but I don't like it here at all. My friends really shouldn't even be considered friends, and we all know how this family life is. The only person that really makes me happy is Billy, and I want to be with him. Think of it this way. There will be no more fights about using the phone line, and the phone bills will be reduced greatly. I could call you every day if you wanted me to, and I would be happy. Billy is the only thing, person, anything that makes me feel truly happy, and moving there would be the greatest thing for our relationship. I'm determined to make this work out. Our fate and my happiness is in your hands, end quote. Of course, Jean told Nicole she would have to remain in her home until she graduated high school, and she wouldn't be changing her mind. The last line of Nicole's letter stuck with me, though. She said their fate was in Jean's hands. Well, unless Nicole ran away, I guess Jean did still have a say in what she did. She's a minor. But as far as Jean was concerned, the discussion was closed. Billy tried writing more letters to Jean, too. In his letters, he promised to be a perfect gentleman with her daughter, and he promised her trust in him would not be misplaced. Jean saw this as an attempt to manipulate the situation, and she wouldn't budge. Her mind was made up. Until Nicole was done with high school, she wasn't going anywhere. And I'm sitting here thinking, none of us know how good we have it as teenagers. We don't have to pay any bills. We're living rent-free. Don't grow up because it's, it's not as fun as it looks. That's what I have to tell teenagers. And I remember writing letters like that to my grandma about like the, I don't know, like frivolous things that I look back on. I could just see how she was like, you know, the phone bills, your parents don't care about the phone bills. They just want you to be safe. Billy couldn't help but feel personally insulted by Jean's refusal to allow her daughter to live with him in another state. But they all tried to make the best of what they did have. Billy continued working hard and saving money and Nicole focused on getting through high school. Things had died down regarding the back and forth between Nicole and her mother. As time passed, they all seemed to resign themselves to their own realities of the situation. Billy and Nicole were young and in love, but not old enough to make big moves on their own, and Jean had to accept that her daughter was becoming more independent. Nicole and Billy relied on chatting online to avoid raising phone bills and upset Jean, but their love and passion for one another was growing stronger. Billy had finally got his driver's license and had saved enough money to buy his own car. His mother did have to co-sign for him, but he reached one of his goals. Now, if he wanted to, he could make the two-hour drive to go and see Nicole. And he wanted to. As a matter of fact, that's what he did. He requested a week's vacation from work and planned a surprise visit to Nicole in early August 2003. That's how he ended up staying at Jean's that week. It was a complete surprise. Neither Nicole nor Jean knew that Billy was coming. And I think it's a pretty sweet gesture. I like surprises like that. And Billy knew it was the summer, so Nicole didn't have school. However, he didn't put much thought into having a plan for where he would stay when he got to New Hampshire, but he just figured Jean would let him stay over her place. And if not, he would figure it out. Even if he had to sleep in his car, he just wanted to see Nicole. Well, of course, she was ecstatic when he pulled up in the driveway. Everyone could tell how happy she was, and Nicole begged Jean to allow Billy to stay. And despite having some reservations, Jean reluctantly agreed to let him stay at their house for the week. She knew how badly they wanted to spend time together, and she did see signs that they were both truly trying to juggle being together, but also abiding by all the rules that Jean set in place. They all seemed to be trying. And of course, Billy wasn't allowed to sleep in Nicole's bedroom. So while he visited, Jean made him sleep on the couch downstairs in the living room. But Nicole would end up sleeping on the floor right next to the couch while holding Billy's hand all night long. (laughs) Wow. 
And one night they all sat down for dinner and Billy said that this was his first home cooked meal in a long time. And Jean seemed surprised and said that he was welcome to come for a home cooked meal at her house anytime he wanted to visit. They spent time having game nights together and Billy and Nicole seemed really happy. But of course, life still went on for Jean and Chris. They still had to work every day and that posed an issue. Jean couldn't help but feel uneasy about leaving Billy and her daughter alone all day together, even though she would be home at night. She was worried about what the teenage couple might be up to. So Jean asked Chris and her neighbor, Karen, to check in on them throughout the day while she was at work. Several times a day, Jean would call Karen to go over there and check on the kids when she was working. Karen had done this before when it was just Nicole and her brother Charlie at home. So it wasn't that much of an ask. She was right next door. She could just walk over. It was actually Chris that brought it up. Jean was a bit naive about teenagers having sex, but Chris thought it was definitely a possibility. Still, Jean was convinced her daughter didn't know about all that. According to Chris, Jean assumed that Nicole and Billy weren't intimate. But remember, we told you Karen was interviewed. She told officers that Jean was kind and sweet and utterly devoted to her children. She also relayed to them that Nicole had begun babysitting for her. And just the day before, Nicole had asked Karen for a favor. She wanted her to buy her a pregnancy test. So they were indeed having sex, or at least had sex once. And remember that Nicole felt like she could confide in Karen I actually recall having those types of relationships with my friend's moms growing up because I grew up with my grandmother and she certainly didn't understand me as a teen, or at least I didn't think she did. So Karen said she did give Nicole a pregnancy test and it came back negative. Nicole seemed relieved. However, even though Karen was doing Nicole a favor, she actually did have plans to tell Jean about the test. She adored Nicole, but parent to parent, it wasn't a confidence that she could keep with Jean's daughter. That was actually what she was on her way to do when she saw all that commotion over at Jean's house that day. She also gave investigators her perception of Billy, even though she had just met him for the first time a day earlier. Nicole had been raving about him for as long as Karen could remember. Billy came over to Karen's and met her children, and she described him as clean cut, quiet, but friendly nice and polite. Okay, so now that you have an understanding about everyone living under Jean's roof, her fiance Chris, and Billy, and even what some of the neighbors are like on Dumaine Avenue, let's go back to Jean and the investigation unfolding that evening. Throughout the night, Nicole had been calling home and leaving messages letting her mother know that she and Billy would be running late, and that they were driving around, going to the mall, doing some shopping, and buying souvenirs for Billy's sisters. But that they'd be home soon, they were just spending as much time together as they could on their last night. Back at the station, Detective Dennis Lynham, who had been in the room during some of Chris's interviews, had to leave to meet the assistant deputy medical examiner, Wayne DiGeronimo, back at the crime scene. He had been there before Jean's body was transported. He had examined the scene and observed Jean in the way she had been found. He relayed the information he had gathered to Detective Lynham and Detective Sergeant Richard Sprangle. DiGeronimo could easily tell with as much experience as he had that Jean had been badly beaten with an object like a baseball bat. The scene and all the blood spatter trailing through the living room and kitchen coupled with the shattered glass coffee table indicated quite an intense struggle. And they even noticed the back door glass had actually been pushed out from the inside. So even though there were no signs of forced entry, there was a forced exit. This could have occurred during the struggle, but the glass was detached from the door and earlier that afternoon, they had discovered two knives in the backyard in addition to the broken handle they found in the sink with the blade uncovered on the floor nearby. As for Jean's body, Di Geronimo could tell that she had been stabbed dozens of times in the neck, throat, head, and torso. She had been stabbed at least 40 to 50 times with apparent defensive wounds on her hands as she tried to block the strikes. Wow, that is really extreme. Stabbed and then brutally beaten. This is a sign that this is a very personal attack. It's like overkill. And actually, later on, Dr. Jenny Duvall, deputy state medical examiner, would detail all of Jean's wounds. And according to Duvall, Jean died slowly after a long struggle. There were approximately 53 stab wounds and cuts to Jean's body. The cuts ranged in depth. Some were more superficial and others were very deep. 28 of the stab wounds were to Jean's neck, throat area, and her face. Another 25 or so were around Jean's chest, mostly in the area right above her heart. 
but these went deep inside. However, only one hit a vital organ, penetrating into her left lung. This is what caused Jean's death. She was basically left on the floor in pain, unable to move and bleeding out, not able to breathe. What could this woman have ever done to someone to deserve this? And wait until you truly hear all that Jean went through. It's just horrific and unbelievable if what you haven't heard isn't already. When detectives relayed this information to officers back at the station, they told Chris and he was shocked. He immediately told the detectives it had to be Jean's former husband. They had a history of violence. He couldn't think of anyone else who would have done this. Jean was deathly afraid of her ex-husband, and she told several of her neighbors that she feared he would someday kill her. And now she's dead. The night was coming to a close. It was around 10 p.m., and Chris had provided as much information as he could. At the end of his interview, they requested that he provided a DNA sample, and Chris cooperated and was willing to help in any way possible. He agreed to provide the requested sample and anything else they needed as he waited for more news on what happened to his fiance. This wouldn't be the last time investigators spoke to him, but for now, he was free to go. At approximately 10.15 p.m., Nicole and Billy arrived back at Jean's house, which was, of course, also a crime scene. As Billy drove his car towards the driveway, an officer actually moved to stand in front of it, instructing him to stop. Then, a few officers surrounded the car. Nicole had a shocked and concerned look on her face and asked what was going on. The officers had no clue who these people were, so there was just a lot of confusion as both Billy and Nicole exited the vehicle. Nicole told one of the officers that she was Jean Domenico's daughter and that she asked them again what happened. At the same time, Billy was telling another officer that he was Nicole's boyfriend and also asked what was happening. Right away, the detectives on the scene figured out who Billy and Nicole were and separated them to bring them down to the station. That's where they would explain what was actually happening and if they can get any information from the teens that could provide help to determine who did this to Jean. As soon as Nicole and Billy were separated, Billy's anxiety increased. It seemed like he was really affected by being apart from the love of his life, and it didn't help that they were now being put in police cars. Right. And I can imagine this being a very anxiety inducing situation. Yes. And as soon as Billy and Nicole were transported to the police station, Billy began to act hyper and agitated. And he repeatedly apologized for not being able to sit still. He told officers that he suffered from high anxiety and had missed taking his medication that day to regulate his mood. Billy kept asking different officers when he could see Nicole, explaining that he had been separated when they arrived at the crime scene. The officers kept saying the same thing to hang tight and everything would be explained to them as soon as they could, but they needed to take their statements separately and then they could be together again. This was all a normal procedure. They began interviewing Billy first because he was 18, but they had to wait for permission from Nicole's father in order to interview her since she was still a minor. The first thing that Detective Linen noticed about Billy was that he had a lot of nervous energy. His legs would shake, swing, and tap on the ground. I do the same thing, and so do you. Sometimes I have to like put my hand on your leg to stop you. People see us I mean, swiveling yeah, all the time. Go like this, but I understand when you're in this position, it might look a little suspicious. Definitely exasperated. One minute he was talkative and friendly, the next he was agitated and nervous. Billy explained that he had spent the week with Nicole and was planning to leave the next morning back home to Connecticut. He told them he needed to call his mom to let her know that everything was okay. Then he told officers he felt like he was going to be sick. He began vomiting into a trash can. At this moment, Billy believed that there was something very wrong. He began having paranoid thoughts and believed that something had to be wrong or they would have allowed him to see Nicole. Well, I think it would have been pretty clear that something was wrong. If you pulled up to your girlfriend's house, there's a bunch of police and detectives and crime scene tape all over the place. Detective Lynham began his questioning by asking Billy basic questions. How long had he known Nicole? How long had they been together? And Billy told him 15 months, but he lied and said they met through a friend instead of online in a chat room. That's when the detective told Billy that Nicole's mother had been seriously injured and he wanted to talk to him about his whereabouts that day to see if he saw or heard anything that could give them a clue as to who might have been responsible. Billy said, wow, and he seemed somewhat detached, but said he would love to help them with whatever he could provide, starting with the fact that he was Jean's daughter's boyfriend and he thought that Jean was a lovely lady. But other than that, he didn't have much information to share. Lynam asked him if he and Nicole had spent the day together, and Billy said they had. 
They went to the bowling alley and probably stopped at Dunkin' Donuts like 1,200 times, his words. Billy was shaking nervously, so Lynam asked him if he needed to take his medication, and he explained that he usually did have to take it at night. So Lynam was going to figure out how he could make that happen, but for now, it was back to the questioning. By this time, they'd also gotten permission to interview Nicole without a lawyer present. So the two teens were being questioned at the same time in different rooms, both giving an account of their day. Billy gave the detective his timeline. When they asked him when he personally spoke to Gene last, he told them he thinks it was about 2 p.m. Gene called the house while Nicole was in the shower, so he answered. Gene asked him to remind Nicole to let the dogs out and told them she was bringing pizza home for dinner and that Chris would be over later. When asked if he could recall anything else that Gene said, Billy explained that it was his last night there and Gene had mentioned looking forward to playing Pictionary with everyone. In all, Billy relayed that he and Nicole went to the bowling alley, Dunkin' Donuts, and then the local mall. He said they went to a shop called Spencer's Gifts, but didn't buy anything. They just walked around. Then Billy allowed the detectives to look at his phone's call log. Meanwhile, Detective Mark Schaaf was down the hall in a room talking to Nicole. Instead of reading Nicole Miranda rights, they read what are called Benoit rights. They are juvenile Miranda rights that are easier to understand. A minor is simply informed that they have the right to remain silent, that anything they say can and will be used against them in a court of law. They have the right to an attorney, and if they cannot afford one, one will be appointed for them. Well, it was pretty scary for Nicole at that moment. She's all alone, has no idea what's going on, and all of this scared her. So she began to cry. She was actually crying so hard it was often difficult to understand what she was saying. But she was cooperative. Of course, they had to inform her of the horrible news. Her mother had been killed. This only made Nicole more upset and unconsolable. But she was finally able to calm down enough to relay her timeline for that day. She had a different order of events than Billy did, because she included several places he left out of his timeline. She told detectives she and Billy had gone to Walmart, purchased some new clothing for Billy, and then went to the movies and watched Pirates of the Caribbean. At this point, Nicole and Billy were just witnesses like everyone else they had talked to that night. Both investigators left their rooms and met up to compare notes. Right away, they noticed considerable discrepancies in the teen's stories. Uh Uh-oh, but honestly, I can't remember what I did in a day. And if I was under pressure, I'd probably forget things too. But because of how crucial it is to understand everywhere the teens had been and develop a solid timeline, the detectives decided to go back in and tell both kids that their stories didn't match, and try to get a little more information out of them. Detective Linen, who was interviewing Billy, said that Billy began showing extreme nervousness. He told the detective he forgot that they went to Walmart. He wasn't sure if they went that day or the day before. See, that's what I'm talking about. That would happen to me because my days kind of like blend together. I kind of forget what I ate for breakfast. I know. Well, Linen explained that Nicole had a receipt in her pocket that showed that they were there that day. Billy then agreed that they were there and must have been, considering they had proof. But Billy said as far as the movie was concerned that they had merely contemplated going to the movies but never actually went inside or watched one. That's interesting. Meanwhile, in the other room, Nicole was still telling Shafe that the couple did stay and watch the whole movie. Nicole also informed the detective that she bought Billy the shirt he was wearing from Walmart, and that's when she showed him the receipt from that exact day. So Lynam asked Billy if he was wearing the new shirt that Nicole had bought him that day at Walmart, and he denied it. It didn't make sense to the detectives to lie about these little things. Was he lying or was he just getting things mixed up or forgetting? And that's what they had to figure out. So they figured they needed to turn up the heat, especially since these were the first inconsistencies that they'd seen all day when interviewing any witnesses. That's when Detective Lionham felt that Billy was lying to him and told him that this would be a massive investigation, which would include DNA evidence, video surveillance, and fingerprints. Billy asked why his whereabouts were so important. He said he didn't understand why he was being questioned. And that's when Billy got angry. He denied having anything to do with whatever happened to Gene. Well, once again, Detective Lionham stepped out and he called upon Detective Sprankle. Now, both of them were going to confront Billy together. It was going to be more interrogation style. They were going to turn up the heat. And Detective Sprinkle joined Billy and Lynam in the room. And again, they asked Billy to tell them about his family, his mental health, and how he spent the day with Nicole. When Detective Sprinkle asked Billy why he seemed so angry, Billy told them that he suffered all of his life 
from debilitating anxiety and intermittent explosive disorder and bipolar, and that he was on mood stabilizers but hadn't taken them in a few days. Okay, we know what's happened in the past when Billy has been off of his meds. He had become aggressive, he threatened self-harm and even hurt other people. So initially, I thought he told the detectives he had only been off his meds since the night before because he was missing the dose that night since they were holding him for questioning. But now he's saying that it's been days and that is not a good sign. And at this point, they hadn't actually told Billy that Jean was dead. They had only told him that she'd been injured. Now they let him in on the fact that she was indeed deceased, but not only that, they told Billy that there were several bloody palm prints and fingerprints left at the scene, which would lead them to the murderer and the case would be solved by using surveillance video from the 7-Eleven located behind Gene's house. That's when Billy told the officers he had a lot weighing on his conscience. Damn, he was about to break, wasn't he? Well, of course, that's what it looked like. At this point, they moved Billy to a larger room, and the detectives began recording the interview and read Billy his Miranda rights. Billy chose to waive his rights and continue speaking with them. What Billy didn't know was that Nicole began opening up down the hall. Through the tears and sobs, Nicole told Detective Schaaf that she and Billy had issues with her mother, Jean. They felt that Jean was keeping them from being together and that Billy felt belittled by her. Remember how Billy mentioned he hadn't had a home-cooked meal in a while? Yeah, and Jean was really nice and she told him that he could come there anytime he wanted a nice meal. Right, but instead of comforting Billy or making him feel included, what Jean said triggered him into a defensive rage. Nicole explained to Shafe that at that moment, Billy snapped back. He said that his mom cooked all the time, and he just worked a lot, and it was easier to eat at work. It's like he had to make sure Jean wasn't implying that Billy's family wasn't good enough. Of course, Jean hadn't meant that as a dig and didn't understand the reason for his big reaction. Nevertheless, as Nicole sat in the police station explaining everything, she expressed feeling that her mother was hard to live with and that they weren't seeing eye to eye and it was only getting worse. Even though the detectives started their night with five potential suspects, Chris, Charlie, Anthony, Nicole, and Billy, it wasn't long before they began to believe that Billy and Nicole may have killed Jean in a plot to be together. With this theory in mind, they reached out to Chris again to get a little more information about Billy's demeanor when he was staying at Jean's. Chris told detectives that all he and Jean noticed that week was pure manipulation by Billy, especially directed at Nicole. His eyes would fill with tears, and he would tell Nicole that he didn't think he could drive home safely without her. His vision would become blurry and tearful if she weren't by his side, and Nicole was frantic at the idea of him leaving without her. Billy would comment that you're never supposed to drive when you're angry or upset, and he would definitely be upset if he were leaving at the end of the week without Nicole. So clearly his plan was to take Nicole with him. And during the entire visit, Billy would make these grand statements like he would be happy married to Nicole and living in a cardboard box on the street. And of course, Jean would scoff at these statements, which unbeknownst to her made Billy feel small and insignificant. Jean just thought, that he was being a typical teenager with lofty dreams and her being much older and wiser, it made her laugh and roll her eyes. But Chris also explained that Jean had heard Nicole crying one night and she went to see what was wrong. And apparently Billy had said some really mean things to Nicole that really, really upset her. And occasionally Billy would confess to cheating on Nicole and then he would make her feel responsible. And it would end in Nicole apologizing to Billy over and over again. This, of course, was more reason for Jean to hope that the couple would break things off. But what she didn't know was that Nicole felt that it was all her mother's fault that Billy was cheating, since it was her mom keeping them apart. So back in the interview room with Nicole, she was telling Shafe all about how Billy told her if he had to return home without her, he would steer his car into oncoming traffic and that they had talked about running away together. But Billy knew that Jean would send the police after them and they wouldn't get very far. He told Nicole they wouldn't last more than two days before police caught up with them and brought them back. Are you ready for the big bombshell? Nicole was on a roll and all of a sudden she admitted that Billy began joking about killing Jean so that they could be together. Or at least in her version of the story, she thought Billy was joking. But then Nicole realized that he was serious. 
Nicole told the detective that Jean used coffee creamer every morning and Billy came up with a plan and he shared it with Nicole. Billy had this idea to lace the creamer with a mixture of what Billy referred to as a lethal combination of ibuprofen, Benadryl, and some other over-the-counter medications that they could buy at the store. What he imagined would happen or hope would happen was that Jean would either die from an overdose or she would fall asleep while driving and have a fatal car accident. Can you even imagine your boyfriend or girlfriend actually sharing this with you? I would be in complete shock. No kidding. But Nicole just stood back. Yeah, I would go to the police at that point, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't even know what I would do. I would just be like, what? Yeah, I'd probably break up with that person at that point. I would probably at least get far away from them. But Nicole stood back and allowed Billy to put his little plan into motion. She provided a chilling account of what happened and claimed it was all Billy. He bought the medicine and then put it inside the creamer while Nicole passively stood by and watched as her mother added the concoction to her morning coffee. It wasn't until later that night that Jean felt sick and dizzy. She said it was a simple case of eating something that had gone bad, but she recovered enough to function and go to work the next day. Even though Nicole initially acted as though this was all Billy's plan, she admitted that both of them were disappointed when the poisoning didn't work. Wow. So she's now on board with planning to kill her mother so that she and her internet boyfriend can be together. How sickening is that? Yeah. And at this point, Billy had a new plan. One he thought was even better. He decided they needed to get a little more aggressive. So he put bleach in Jean's creamer. Stop it. Okay, now that's just crazy. Yeah, except that didn't work. The next day, they saw the creamer in the trash. They assumed Jean noticed it, smelled it, or tasted it, and threw it away. Yeah, I mean, you would smell that. It's very distinctive. But I'm thinking, wouldn't Jean have questioned why her creamer smelled like bleach? I mean, I would turn into detective mode and really be watching my back and probably suspecting these kids were up to no good. Poor Jean. That's just horrible. Personally, I like the smell of bleach, but I definitely wouldn't drink it. Yeah, you like the smell of bleach when you clean the bathroom, not when you're sipping on your coffee. And the next day, Billy had another new plan. They were going to set Jean on fire inside of her room and let her succumb to the smoke inhalation and the flames. Well, that certainly escalated quickly. And all the while, Nicole is okay with this? And Billy isn't afraid of fire? I mean, I thought he was so traumatized by the motel burning down. Well, it appears that way because while Jean was at work, they went into her room to figure out how to best stage an accidental fire. Billy used a lighter on the tip of Jean's blanket to make sure it was flammable. It wasn't. The blanket wouldn't catch fire. They figured out it was flame retardant. Undeterred, Billy had another plan. He and Nicole drove to Home Depot and purchased a long, thin rope. Billy planned to place one end of the rope into an oil tank in the back of the house soak the rope in gasoline, and then light the other end inside the house. Billy told Nicole the house would blow up and then they would be down the block by the time it happened. Billy thought using the gasoline-soaked rope as a fuse was a genius plan. He's a man with many plans, but Nicole explained to the detective that before carrying out the fire, she packed her diary and some clothes in a bag and headed to the backyard to place the rope into the fuel tank as instructed. However, Chris was outside talking to Billy and Nicole got worried she was going to get caught. So instead, she ran to the edge of the woods and disposed of the rope behind her mother's house. And later, Nicole grabbed the rope and threw it in the garbage can. So far, all of their plans had failed. And Nicole told Shafe that after the rope incident, they decided their plan shouldn't include fires or blowing up houses. By this time, it seemed Nicole had become desensitized to killing her mother because she sat there heartlessly explaining how disappointed she and Billy were with all of their failed attempts on ending her mother's life. When she was asked why they wanted to kill Jean so badly, Nicole casually explained that her mother wouldn't allow her to move to Connecticut to be with Billy, as if that was a perfectly good reason to execute the mother who had loved her and nurtured her throughout her entire life. Her coldness was chilling. Meanwhile, Billy was in another room explaining that he had promised Nicole that they would be together. And once he had made a promise, he had to go through with it. That's when Billy said he came up with the idea of sneaking up behind Jean with a baseball bat and hitting her in the head. At first, Nicole had mixed feelings about the plan, but eventually she thought it was the best case scenario. At this point, Nicole hated her mother for wanting her to be miserable and keeping her from Billy. She would explain to him how terrible her mother was and how awful it was to live with her. 
So this new plan involved Billy strategically placing a baseball bat within easy reach inside the home. Billy was going to plan to attack Jean until she was dead. This is when everything came out. Billy explained that at 4.40 p.m. on August 6th, he and Nicole went to the bowling alley to finalize their plan of attack and to create an alibi. The bowling alley was five minutes away from Jean's house, and they would be on surveillance video with a rock-solid alibi. This past week together strengthened their bond, and they now believe they couldn't be apart more than ever. They drove to the nearby Dunkin' Donuts and eagerly waited for Jean to return home from work. Their hearts pounding with anticipation, Billy's mind raced with various thoughts and emotions as they sat inside the car. He knew this act of violence would forever change their lives, but he convinced himself it was necessary. Finally, they saw Jean's car pulling into the driveway, signaling the beginning of their meticulously planned execution. They drove by Nicole's house to ensure her mother had gotten inside. She did. Her car was empty and parked in the driveway. This was it. Billy and Nicole parked across the street at the 7-Eleven parking lot. Nicole bought a teen magazine and sat back in the car as Billy walked over to the house. I am in utter disbelief that this is even real, but unfortunately it is. And what we're about to tell you is so heartbreaking and so evil, so please prepare yourself. It was now 6 p.m. and Billy told Nicole the whole thing wouldn't take him more than two minutes. Billy told detectives that he walked into the house with plans to do it, but his conscience began to weigh on him. Jean was sitting at the kitchen table when Billy walked through the door. Jean faced him, and Billy said, Hi, Jean. He said that Jean appeared surprised and slightly alarmed to see him alone without Nicole. She asked him where her daughter was, and then he just began making small talk about baseball. Next, he went into Charlie's room and came out swinging an aluminum baseball bat. Billy began making small talk with Jean about his favorite teams that year. And while talking, Jean and Billy both went into the living room and sat down while they were presumably waiting for Nicole to come back home. At one point, Jean asked Billy to put the baseball bat down because it was making her nervous. He began taking practice swings and Jean was worried he was going to hit something in the house. I would be so confused. I'd be thinking, where's my daughter and what is this kid doing? He's just randomly swinging a baseball bat around her living room. And that's when Billy picks up Nicole's cordless phone and called his cell phone, which was in the car with Nicole. She answered, and she wanted to know what was taking him so long. He told her that Jean was getting nervous, and he thought that she may be onto him. According to Billy, Nicole accused him of not being able to go through with it. So Billy told her he had to go, and Nicole told him to stop taking so long. After he ended the call, Jean asked him if he was talking to Nicole and told him to tell her to get her ass home now. But Billy ignored her and continued to talk about baseball. He confessed to detectives that he was in a trance and couldn't hear what Jean was saying. Finally, Jean asked him what was happening and what was wrong with him. A minute later, Nicole's cordless phone began ringing, and Billy answered it. By now, the two minutes had turned into ten, and Nicole told him there was a cop at the bank. Billy told her not to worry about it and promised everything would be okay. He told her he would be out soon. Later, Nicole would say he was speaking slowly, matter-of-factly, and was on edge. That's when Jean's patience was over. She wanted to know where Nicole was and why she wasn't with Billy. He told her that Nicole was across the street. At that moment, Billy got upset that Jean was yelling and getting mad at Nicole. He decided a mother shouldn't treat a daughter that way. Suddenly, a surge of violence came over him. He raised the baseball bat and aimed it for the back of Jean's head. But she turned, and instead, he hit her shoulder. He told the detectives it came to a point where he realized he would do anything for love, and that meant swinging a bat at the head of his girlfriend's mother so that they could be together. Wow. They're risking their entire future over teenage love. Well, the blow to Jean's shoulder didn't incapacitate her the way that he had planned in his mind. Instead, it pushed her up against the wall and startled her. Jean allegedly screamed, what the fuck are you doing? Recently, Jean had told friends that she thought something was off with Billy, but she never imagined he would become violent with her because that was actually discussed between her and her friends. And now it was a reality. How frightening. Billy explained that for a minute, Jean's outburst startled him. He realized in that moment that if he stopped now, Jean would never allow him to have any contact with Nicole again. And worse, Jean would press criminal charges against him. 
everything happened in slow motion when he realized he needed to kill her to keep Nicole. He lunged at her and they both fell on the coffee table, smashing it into pieces. For several long minutes, Jean put up an intense fight, scratching, kicking, and even pulling Billy's hair to get him to stop. But he didn't. He was relentless. Billy told detectives that he and Jean were wrestling until she managed to get up and run for the back door near the kitchen. But he caught up to her and he pulled her back into the house and she fell backwards on top of him. Billy said when Jean realized she couldn't get out the back door, she tackled him. That's when he thought that he needed to finish it as quickly as possible. Those were his words. They were now inside the kitchen and Billy broke free and then ran and grabbed a steak knife from the counter. Jean's worst fear was coming true. She always believed she would die being stabbed to death. Billy lunged at her and stabbed her right in the shoulder with the knife. He used so much force that the knife blade broke off in his hand, causing him to get a small cut. Billy went to the kitchen again, and this time he grabbed a butcher's knife. Billy's confession sent shockwaves through the room. The detectives were in disbelief as Billy revealed Jean's tragic fate. Now he began stabbing Jean in the upper torso, neck, and face. He stabbed her a few times in the throat, wondering what was taking her so long to die. But as we explained from the medical examiner, Dr. Duvall, it turns out none of his stab wounds were fatal except for the one that nicked her lung, but it would be a number of thrusts before that occurred. But once Billy finally hit her lung, it slowly filled with blood. When asked how many times he thinks he stabbed her, Billy said that he thought he stabbed her maybe eight times. We know it was closer to over 50 times, and that takes so much rage. It's actually quite exhausting to raise your arm and come down with such force again and again. That's over 100 movements up and down over and over again. As Billy continued his story, the detectives noticed it matched the evidence. There was a window pane in the door that was broken from the inside out, and police initially thought that this was an attempt to make it look like a burglary with the glass going in the wrong direction. Instead, it was Jean's last burst of energy. She had picked up a knife and lunged at him, but slipped in her own blood and fell into the window, which pushed out the glass. This is when Jean went down and never came back up. Billy was standing over her when she took her last breath, and he said that her last words were, I'm done. And that is just so heartbreaking. Billy told the detectives he had to make sure she was dead so she couldn't call 911 and tell them what happened to her. Remember the medical examiner describing all the places Jean had been stabbed? Well, there were wounds in Jean's back, on her wrist, her chest, and throat, even her face. There were 13 on the right side of her head, 9 in the back of her neck, and head, altogether 50 from the top of her head to her torso. Apparently some of those were after she was lying on the ground unable to move. Maybe he thought that she was faking it because there's a lot of people that have actually survived by just like lying really still and holding their breath until the killer walks away. So he sat there and continued to stab her to make sure that she would never get up. Billy confessed that he hastily gathered the incriminating evidence and fled the scene as quickly as possible. Billy didn't realize he left bloody fingerprints behind on the knives, the baseball bat, and the palm print on the refrigerator. And before he left, he was covered in blood, and he goes upstairs to change, leaving bloody footprints on the stairs that led straight up to Nicole's bedroom. Right, and when he changed clothes, not even realizing he had blood on his face, arms, and his hands. And what sickens me is while this life and death struggle is happening between her mother and her boyfriend, Nicole was sitting in Billy's car at the 7-Eleven parking lot, just fully absorbed in her new teen magazine. She had even lost track of time, so when Billy returned and slapped the car windshield, it startled her. Once back at the car, Billy told Nicole he realized he left his inhaler back at the house and needed a towel for the blood on his face and hands. His new shirt had blood on it too, so he realized he would need another new shirt. That's when he told Nicole that she had to go back in the house and get what he needed. He said he had done his part and this was her part. Nicole had no idea the kind of brutality her mother went through, but she knew she didn't want to go back inside that house. She could see the blood on Billy. She didn't want to see her mother or the consequences of their actions, but Billy insisted she had to go back in. And Nicole would later tell detectives that she didn't like to defy him. Nicole pushed the door open that was partially blocked by her mother's body. She finally saw what Billy had done 
And instead of rendering aid or calling 911, she just callously stepped right over her mother and proceeded to fulfill Billy's demands. She noticed that Billy had left behind a knife. She grabbed it and disposed of it along with the things he asked for. When she got back to the car, she said, oh my God, oh my God, she's dead. As if the gravity of her plan was just hitting her in that moment. The next thing they did was go and purchase Billy a new shirt, which he was wearing while he was being interviewed at the police station. Once Nicole returned to the car, she and Billy embarked on a mission to dispose of the evidence. They drove to several locations, carefully discarding any incriminating items that could link them to the crime. After successfully removing any traces of their involvement at various spots, they headed to Walmart to get Billy some new clothes. Both teens had been confessing to what happened that day. Their stories weren't exactly the same, but we told you a combination of their confessions and what detectives could determine from the investigation. After her confession, Nicole cooperated with the police and provided them with information regarding the whereabouts of the hidden evidence. Acting upon her disclosure, investigators swiftly recovered several crucial items. Among the recovered pieces of evidence were the bloody bat, a set of knives, and Billy's shirt. Unbeknownst to Chris at the time, Nicole and Billy were both arrested and charged with Jean's murder. When Chris left the station, he had no answers about what had happened, and he was told Charlie was going home with his dad to Massachusetts. This upset Chris because he knew Jean would not want her son going back with his father, but the police explained there wasn't anything they could do about it since he was the only living legal guardian. As Chris left the station, Charlie was sitting on the stairs out front. Chris put his arms around Charlie and told him he would help him through this. Then he asked him if he would be okay with his father, and he said yes. That's when Charlie said something that would turn out to be profoundly prophetic. He turned to Chris and said, he did this. When Chris asked him who he was talking about, he said Billy. Chris tried to comfort him and told him he had it wrong, that Billy wasn't involved, but Charlie just kept repeating that he knew Billy was responsible. Something in that last week that Charlie observed or overheard or intuitively interpreted was telling him that his sister's boyfriend was responsible for his mother's murder. And the next day he wrote on Facebook, quote, Mom, I miss you so much. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you when you needed me the most. I'm sorry I let you down. I love you, end quote. The next day, the victim's advocate called Chris McGowan and told him that he had two people in custody for Jean's murder. And she had some good news and some bad news. Then she asked him to sit down and told him the two suspects that were in custody were Nicole and Billy. And Chris was shocked. The advocate told him that they both confessed and the evidence matched the confessions. Chris still couldn't wrap his mind around what he had been told. He wondered if Billy had done the killing and Nicole was just covering for him after the fact. He thought maybe Billy had threatened Nicole and forced her to take part. It's hard to imagine someone we love being capable of such a heinous crime. But by the time Billy was on trial, Chris would learn that Nicole was not only a willing participant, but others believe she was the driving force behind all of this. Following his arrest, Billy immediately blamed Nicole for quickly caving and confessing. And of course, he insisted Nicole had way more to do with it than it being all him that came up with the plans. The news of Jean's brutal murder spread rapidly through Nashua, causing shock and disbelief within the community. Billy's family, like everyone else, was utterly stunned by the tragic news. Billy's mother had spoken to him the day of the murder. It was around 7.30 p.m., so this would have been after he killed Jean. And Pat said he sounded fine. He was calm and told her that he and Nicole were just driving around town doing some shopping. Pat told him not to spend too much money, and then she asked if he had been taking his medications. He lied and said that he had. She knew how fast he could become unhinged when he didn't take his meds. But to this extent, that was unreal. Really though, because he's been violent in the past, so I wondered, was it that shocking after all the things he had ever done? Right. But as his mother, I understand why she's trying to put the best face for it for her son. Nicole and Billy were charged with first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. In the case of Nicole, she was going to be tried as an adult due to the severity and brutality of the crime. Billy pleaded not guilty because of insanity. Once in jail, he began talking to a new 15 year old girl and he convinced her that Nicole and another boy had committed the murder and they were framing him. And he promised that once he was released from prison, that they would be together. 
And just like with Nicole, he began telling her he loved her and he told her how she had to become emancipated from her parents so that they could run off together. He told her that they would run away and they would go live with his aunt. He even had his aunt sneak her into jail to visit him while pretending to be one of his sisters. And eventually, this girl's friends went to her parents and told them about the dangers of her new felon boyfriend. She would later testify against Billy, showing his pattern of control and isolation of the young girls who crossed his path. Billy's attorney argued that he was not competent to stand trial. According to the evaluating doctor, Billy was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder which made him susceptible to aggression. The doctor stated that Billy lacked the internal mechanisms to control his impulsive actions. And that makes sense. Borderline is very hard to treat, but I wanted to make it clear that just because someone has been diagnosed with this disorder does not mean that they're evil or dangerous or a killer. So just understand that so many other variables are at play here. And I don't think it's fair to label an entire population of people because something like this happened. Nicole made a deal with the prosecution to testify against Billy in court. In exchange for her testimony, she received a sentence of 40 years in prison. However, there was a provision in the agreement that her sentence would be reduced by five years if she attained her GED and college degree while behind bars. Judge William Groff described her part in her mother's murder as, quote, heart-wrenching and senseless, end quote. He said she was every bit as guilty in her mother's murder as Billy. Nicole declined to make a statement at her sentencing. Still, she became emotional when Jean's fiancé, Chris, gave a statement recalling how much Jean loved Nicole and how it was repaid with the ultimate betrayal. Billy's trial began in 2005. Nicole gave testimony against him, stating that she was merely a lookout during the murder of her mother. She claimed that Billy had manipulated her into participating in the crime. Billy's mother also testified. She told the jury everything we told you earlier about his past. She admitted that she was not a good mother. She confessed that she drank at least a six-pack of beer every day of her pregnancy and believed that that is why Billy was born prematurely and maybe was also why he had so many issues. I just want to point out that despite a background of domestic issues and addiction, Billy always thought of his mother as a superhero and a warrior who fought to keep them all together. Recall how upset he got when Gene insinuated that his mother didn't cook him meals? Mm -hmm. Well, Pat went on to tell the jury that as a toddler, Billy became hyperactive and violent. He would get into rages where he would end up destroying things and hitting his younger sisters, cutting off all of their hair, or trying to smother them in toothpaste to make them, quote, dead. This is what he imagined he was doing to his sisters. Billy began explaining to Pat his detailed plans for how he planned to die. And on one occasion, he told her he was going to stand on a big rock and jump in the river until it took him away and killed him. It's true. Billy had a very difficult past. And the week he stayed with Nicole, he had stopped taking all of his medication. For this reason, Billy believed he belonged in a psychiatric hospital instead of prison. But a jury disagreed and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Two years later, Billy won an appeal to a new trial. And this trial was not to determine his guilt or innocence, but rather to assess his mental state, whether he was considered to be insane or not. Billy was again found not to be insane by the court, and his sentence was upheld. He was resentenced to life in prison. Thankfully. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't end that way, and people like him are released into the world again, only to reoffend, sometimes worse than they did the first time. And in closing, I want to mention that till this day, Chris maintains a memorial page on Facebook where friends of Jean and anyone that knew her can document the small acts of kindness in her name. When people think of love, they usually think of the unconditional beauty of love. But in this case, it's a stark reminder that sometimes love can be darker. It can be a powerful force. But when it becomes twisted and distorted, it can lead down a path of destruction leaving devastation in its wake. We, of course, want to thank you for being here for Jean's story. It's truly a heartbreaking one, and it it makes me fear being a mother, but I know that this is probably a very unlikely scenario. You've always got to think about it, though. I do think about it. Mm-hmm. I'm always like, I... Oh, we got one on the way. I know. I'm always like, I hope my daughter doesn't meet some weirdo... He convinces her. Well, thank you all so very much for being here. We will see you in our very next episode. And like always, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out.
We'll see you in our next episode. Bye. Bye.